Hello, welcome everyone to the Leading with Emotional Intelligence webinar led by Dr. Dara Rossi. We're so excited that you all are here today joining us for um, this last webinar of 2023. This is part of our new Paradigm Leadership Educational Series, and it's been a really fantastic year of learning, and um, we're excited for those of you who have joined us on several of these webinars, and we hope you'll come back in 2024 for next year's new Paradigm Leadership Educational Series. If you'll progress the slides, Dara. Uh, the uh, New Paradigm Leadership Series is brought to you by Workplace Peace Institute Leadership Academy. Um, here at Workplace Peace Institute, we are singularly focused on helping organizations create workplace cultures where everyone can thrive. And we know to do that, we need a lot of learning and development um, ongoing for, for all leaders. And here at the Workplace Peace Institute, we really believe that we are all leaders. We all have the ability to influence and impact um, change in our specific sphere of influence. So our leadership courses are designed to optimize real specific competencies in human behavior. Uh, we know that people need to grow their communication skills. We all need to be able to engage directly in conflict. So we have a few conflict resolution courses. We also have diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging courses. All of these courses are designed to create highly engaged workplaces where basic human needs and dignity needs are consistently honored. And as I mentioned, we are singularly focused on supporting leaders in creating workplace cultures where all people thrive. We know that when people thrive, organizations thrive. Next slide, please. So I want to introduce you to Dr. Dara Rossi. She is a Workplace Peace Institute Leadership Academy instructor and facilitator. She's an ICF credentialed coach, and um, she's one of the smartest people I know. So I'm really excited that you all will have the opportunity to learn from her today. She holds master's degrees in business administration and dispute resolution. She also has a PhD in education. She's passionate about the personal and professional development of others, and she works diligently to help her clients cultivate skills and behaviors that support their success, impact, and fulfillment. She's coached both established and emerging leaders across many industries, and she currently serves on the board for the International Coaching Federation of North Texas. In addition to her coaching and consulting work, uh, Dr. Rossi teaches graduate level courses at universities and um, enjoys facilitating training and developing um, development programs for a wide range of clients. So I'm happy that you're gonna get to spend the next hour with her. She has a presentation that she's gonna provide for you on leading with emotional intelligence. And then we'll have some time for a Q&A at the end. As we're going through this webinar, if you wanna drop questions that come to mind for you in the chat, We'll address those uh, at the end. Um, and you can also just raise your hand at the end and have an, a, a casual Q&A. So with that, I will hand it over to you, Dr. Rossi. Great, thank you so much. Welcome, welcome. I'm thrilled to be here with you today because I get to talk about two of my favorite things, the intersection of leadership and emotional intelligence. Uh, and I love both of those topics. So on our learning, ship, or our learning journey today, there's really three areas that I wanna explore. One is what is emotional intelligence? And you may be saying, ah, I already know about that. It's okay. Maybe you'll learn something new today. And then why is it important, especially in leadership? And then how do I develop it, right? We can continue to develop. It doesn't matter what level you're at. We can continue to grow in that area. Uh, and you may know this, that emotional intelligence is often uh, designated with the EI uh, and sometimes EQ, which means emotional quotient, which we will talk about uh, now. So what is emotional intelligence? So let's get started. Uh, we all probably have an idea. I'm certain that everyone on this webinar and, and those that may watch it later have heard of emotional intelligence and have some idea of what it is. It's been around for quite some time and um, it's really been a buzzword, or as we like to say, it's trending now uh, in, the, in the recent years. However, just because it's something's trending, right, and it's a buzzword doesn't really mean that we know all about it. So let's dig into it a little bit. 
And I think in order to understand it, we first have to start and look at the differences between uh, IQ, EQ, and your personality, because some of those get blended sometimes. So EQ is really the measurement of a person's emotional intelligence, which is, you know, that ability to, to understand your own feelings and the feelings of those around you. And then EQ is absolutely distinct from your IQ. Um, you may have a high emotional intelligence and also have a really high IQ. You can be low in one and not the other. You can be low in both, right? It, it, they don't really occur together in any meaningful way, despite the stereotype that people think that um, really high IQ people have very low EQs, right? That's, that's a stereotype. That's not true. People often really also confuse emotional intelligence and personality. Personality is, is really, it's a stable set of preferences and tendencies um, through which you approach your world. Uh, it's fixed at early age, uh, just like your IQ. So if you're, say, an extreme uh, introvert at 17, you can probably expect that you're going to be an introvert at 40, right? That doesn't really change a lot. Uh, we do learn ways to adapt and to overcome some of that, but it doesn't necessarily change. So personality occurs in a part of the brain, which uh, neurologists call, they, they call it, it's crystallized, which means it's fixed. It's not responsive to change, like I said, like the IQ. Now, emotional intelligence, on the other hand, is an area of the brain where the, the pathway between your emotional and your rational brain, and it has plasticity, which means that it's flexible and that it, it is responsive to change. So yay. Um, and when you work on your emotional intelligence, um, your neurons, they actually branch out to other neurons in your brain and they increase the flow of information between your rational and your emotional brain. Um, so that's in essence what, what emotional intelligence is and the difference between those three. So while the talk about emotional intelligence, well, you know, it's it's the ability to, to recognize and evaluate and, and even manage your emotions. And it's also the awareness of other folks around you. Uh, but so what? Well, our lives are built on and around emotions. Emotions affect not only how we feel, uh, but they affect, more importantly, I would say, how we behave, like what we do. Uh, in other words, emotions are in the driver's seat. And you can choose to be a backseat passenger and just be along for the ride, or you can learn how to navigate. And this navigation begins with truly understanding those fundamentals around uh, emotional intelligence. I like this table here, and it shows the four competencies that are widely accepted and associated with emotional intelligence. So let's start with, with the, uh, the personal uh, competence, uh, of the, those left quadrants there. Um, these are comprised of, of two, of self-awareness and self-management skills, which really focus more on you individually uh, as opposed to your interactions with other people. And personal competence is really, that's your ability to, um, to stay aware of emotions and then manage behaviors and tendencies that come along with that. So if we look at self-awareness, that upper left quadrant, uh, that's really your ability to um, accurately perceive your emotions and stay aware of them like when it's happening in the moment, which can be really difficult to do sometimes, especially with elevated emotions. And then in the bottom left is self-management. So that's once you're once you become aware of your emotions, you can stay flexible. You can you can positively direct your behavior. You can decide how you're going to behave. Right. You choose or you manage what you say and what you do during those elevated emotional states. So let's look at the white, the right quadrant now, and those are your your social uh, competencies, and these are made up of your social awareness and also um, your relationship management skills. So social competence really is your ability to understand other people's moods, uh, their behaviors, their motives, right? To be able to respond effectively and to, to uh, improve the quality of your relationships. That's, that's key there. So if we look at social awareness, the upper uh, right-hand quadrant, that's your ability to, to accurately like pick up on other people's emotions, to know what's going on even without them speaking, uh, and to understand really what's, what's happening in the situation. And then the bottom right-hand quadrant, that is relationship management. And that's where once you know what's going on, you have this awareness, you're able to, to, to know about the emotions of others, uh, that you, you, can, you, can manage, you can manage what happens, the interactions successfully, appropriately. 
Um, these allow you, I think, to really build strong connections and, and much deeper relationships, both personally uh, and professionally. And if we look from the left to the right, we can also see that um, both self-awareness and, and the social um, awareness uh, are really what we see. And then on the bottom, if you look at self-management and relationship management, that's what we do, right? Um, so just a little distinction there on that. Now, you'll see the circles in the middle. That's because these, these build on each other, right? The more you're self-aware, the more you can be social aware. Uh, the more you're self-aware, the more you can manage yourself, right? And they, they're all connected together. It needs these four components in order to work uh, appropriately and build your emotional intelligence. What we're going to do now is we're going to watch a little video that describes a little bit about emotion and how it works in the brain. Uh, it, and it'll just tell you what's happening as we're experiencing the emotion and maybe listen for something new. If, if this is all like, I know all this stuff, listen to see if you, you hear something you didn't really know or something maybe that you feel is important. When we hear the word emotion, most of us think of love, hate, happiness, or fear. Those strong feelings we experience throughout life. Our emotions are the driving force behind many of our behaviors, helpful and unhelpful. Just where do our emotions come from? Our brain is wired to look for threats or rewards. If one is detected, the feeling region of the brain alerts us through the release of chemical messages. Emotions are the effect of these chemical messages traveling from our brain through the body. When our brain detects a potential threat, our brain releases the stress hormones adrenaline and cortisol, which prepare us for a fight or flight response. When we detect or experience something rewarding, such as someone doing something nice for you, our brain releases dopamine, oxytocin, or serotonin. These are the chemicals that make us feel good and motivate us to continue on the task or behavior. In these instances, the feeling region of the brain kicks in before the thinking part Sometimes the reactions of the feeling brain are so strong that it dominates our behaviors and we're unable to think rationally in the moment. Our emotions hijack our brain. While many of our emotional responses happen subconsciously, our thinking can influence our emotions and sometimes this can be unhelpful. Just thinking about something threatening can trigger an emotional response. This is where we can manage our emotions with conscious thinking. Our emotions play a powerful role in the way we experience the world. Understanding and regulating our emotions through our thoughts and behaviors can help us take greater control of our brain and achieve our goals. Okay, so taking control of our brain, that's, that's what we want to do here. Let me break this down just a little more. Uh, and just go over some of the things that maybe you saw in the video. Uh, although, you know, emotions and feelings uh, are, are used interchangeably. I think I do that as well. There really is a distinct difference. And emotions are those, that physiological response to an experience, right? It's it's an activator. Uh, for example, if uh, if a driver pulls out in front of you, um, and, and hits their brakes, right? Your, your sympathetic nervous system kicks into gear. I like to call that the 911 nervous system, right? And, and as the video said, it sends those signals to your organs to get ready for action. Your heart rate might increase and, and your palms sweat a little bit. That adrenaline really kicks in. And the feeling, let's say it's just, um, it's vengefulness, right? It happens in your mind, uh, which will most likely dictate your actions, or, or at least it would for me. I'll speak from my, my uh, point of view. Um, individuals with really high IQ have learned to, to process this emotion, right? And avoid a confrontation. Individuals with lower EQ, on the other hand, um, might pull up next to the driver and, and yell with a hand gesture, right? And potentially encounter a, a road rage uh, situation, which we see about in the news all the time. Now, this process is different for each of us, right? The, the researcher, um, uh, Lisa Barrett, who's a, a world expert in, in the psychology of emotion, 
has discovered that emotions are not physically experienced the same by everyone. And furthermore, they're, they're not universal expressions of emotions. So it's uh, hard to look at someone and see exactly how they are feeling, right? Uh, there needs to be a conversation uh, that goes along uh, with that. So let's talk about, you know, this emotional state. If you're, you're in an emotional state and your behavior is the same every time, it becomes wired in our brains. Meaning that each time you experience that particular emotion, you react in the in the similar or the same pattern. It, it's like um, taking a particular pathway uh, and you're hiking on a trail in the Colorado mountains. It's easier to go down the same path that's that's already made than it is to create your new your a new path. Sometimes, uh, when we understand and manage you know our emotions and our feelings, we can rewire the brain. We can change our behavior result and create a more effective pathway to go on. And let me give you an example of that. When I was first married quite a few years ago, um, I uh, wasn't a good cook. I'm a good cook now. Trust me. I love to cook and I'm a good cook, but I wasn't. And I made dinner for my husband one night and he said, oh, there's, there's too many onions in this. I became offended. I was hurt. Oh, there were so many emotions going on that I didn't recognize then that I just got up and scraped our dinner in the garbage. Uh, and, uh, so that, that needless to say, didn't go well. Um, and so the next time I make something, I'm trying something new again. He, he made a comment. I immediately got angry and just scraped my food in the garbage and left the table. This happened several times. I thought this is not going to make for a successful marriage here. If we're having a fight every time I cook, either a, we're going to go out and eat all the time, or I'm never going to learn how to cook. Right. There were so many, um, not optimal, uh, resolutions to that. So instead, when he said, hmm, there's too many onions in this or whatever the next meal was, I, I took deep breaths to let myself just process. I didn't realize what I was doing at the time, but I was breathing. I was relaxing. I was I was feeling that emotion of hurt or, or whatever it was at the point at that point. And I decided to do something different. When I calmed down after breathing for a few minutes, I said, hmm, do you like something about the dish? And he said something. I'm like, what is it? Is the onion flavor too much? So in other words, I got curious and tried to understand what it was that he did or didn't like about the dish so that I could change it. So it's a simple little example. But I was just thinking about that the other day and wanted to share something with you. Uh, and so it was that way. So I changed the neural pathway in my brain. I didn't go down the same, oh, you don't like it? Let's throw it in the garbage. I became curious and I actually learned to cook uh, as a result of that. So quick example for you there. So that was emotional intelligence, a little bit of how it works. So why emotional intelligence? And particularly, why do leaders need to, uh, to have uh, strong emotional intelligence skills? Let's talk about that. Uh, I've heard this said many times and seen it written that leadership is an inside job. Now, we know, obviously, that it manifests itself in external relationships, in communication, in inspiring others, in coaching. But ultimately, it's an inside job because inner work is needed in order to develop self-awareness uh, about your, your business acumen, but self-awareness about your emotional intelligence. And to be an effective leader, it's really necessary to understand and, and, and skillfully manage your emotions appropriately. This helps leaders develop better relationships with others. And leaders who have better relationships with people usually develop high levels of trust. So what's the effect of that? Well, as a result, leaders are exposed to more information, more accurate information, more thorough information, right? People are going to share because they trust them. And this leads in turn to what? Better decisions, better outcomes uh, for the company, all sorts of, of great uh, a great things as a result of that, building those relationships. And when you, you reframe EI or EQ, either one, you know, past these buzzwords, it's, you know, you hear it, you say, okay, I know about, uh, about emotional intelligence and it's been around for years, but, but, you know, you have to think about, do we really, do we really think that relationships are important or unimportant? People want to be around. They want to work for. They want to walk through fire for people who give them high regards, who give them respect, recognition, appreciation, who show empathy, right? So that's what you want from a leader that you work for. That's the people you want to be around in a relationship with. So leaders really have to be more emotionally intelligent 
to be effective and efficient at maximizing, maximizing outcomes, like all kinds of outcomes, right? And to be able really to effectively interact with others, that's the key. Um, leadership is mainly engaged in human relations. Then leadership at its core is largely about emotions. So this goes back to the slide where I said that emotions are in the driver's seat. You're either along for the ride or you're learning to navigate because we as humans want to be connected and leadership is about human relationships and that connectedness. So you have a choice, uh, learn to navigate or sit in the back seat and go along for the ride. There's another reason that emotional intelligence is, is critical for, um, for leaders, and that's because there's the ripple effect in the organizations. It's not just isolated to, uh, to certain teams. Um, you know, we know that technical skills and, and business acumen, industry knowledge, cognitive abilities, right? These are, these are uh, skills that are necessary for leaders. It'd be silly to say, those and other companies, they really don't matter, right? No, those are key for, for today's leaders. But here's the yes and, and research has confirmed it. The importance of the additional set of skills that really impact their effectiveness uh, have to do around emotional intelligence. And, and these competencies, which we talked about, right? It's, it's social emotional skills really help, um, help leaders determine how people perceive them and how to express themselves. They help, it helps them maintain social uh, relationships and, and cope with changes, which is constant now, right? Uh, it, it helps them overcome challenges, all of those great things. So if, if leaders have this high emotional intelligence, they can foster teams with, with good interpersonal skills and, and they get along, there's trust, there's commitment. Um, and it creates this ripple effect through organizations uh, and a culture of uh, that that allows for uh, employee engagement and lower turnover and ultimately a more productive and profitable uh, business. Some research recently that that I was reading that talks about when uh, when companies invest in emotional intelligence training, right? And, and emotional intelligence is, is the culture in the workplace. There's some positive effects that support that support, uh, uh, that, that support um, managers and, and one is, uh, or leaders, sorry. One is um, a motivating, inspiring and reinforcing quality work. That's great. How about decreasing turnover and, and, and increasing posit uh, productive, uh, positive productivity? Right. Building supportive culture for staff. How about creating greater collaboration among colleagues, opening paths to new ideas, to innovation and, and maximizing um, the effects or sorry, minimizing the effects of groupthink. Right. Groupthink always brings down the quality of ideas and, and the innovation and the creativity. There's a few more that I wanted to share. Um, also, emotional intelligence, when you have training in the workplace, that it, it opens, uh, it helps with recognition and empathy to resolve conflicts. Conflicts in the workplace are common, uh, and you can either resolve those or they can build and build and build until they finally explode. Um, it empowers leaders to recognize and pursue new opportunities that they may have missed because they were blinded, because they didn't listen to people, because they didn't have the trust. Uh, they didn't have deep, meaningful relationships with, uh, with their, their uh, workforce. And it improves company morale and amplifies voices of those who, who may have been too scared to speak up or didn't share ideas. So there's this positive ripple effect through organizations when emotional intelligence uh, has, the, the organization has embraced training uh, and utilized it. Here's a quote by uh, Roger uh, Pierman. And what he says is that uh, what builds great and sustainable organizations are leaders with a high degree of business acumen, specific skills, planning and control. But he goes further to say, and emotional intelligence, methods to keep people motivated and engaged, leaders who have a sensitivity to relationships and do good jobs of building relationships have something beyond business skills that help organizations succeed. They have highly developed emotional intelligent behaviors. There's some more relation, um, sorry, more um, research that I wanted to share with you. And this is in um, reference to leadership gender gaps. 
And the research shows that women often score higher in some emotional intelligent areas, particularly those related to, to people skills, what we think of as people skills. And you can see some of those, uh, those areas here. Empathy is the first one. And that's important because it governs the way in which we, we interact with, with, with people, right? It impacts the way our personal relationships develop. Uh, some other key areas that you can see here, women score higher in building relationships and social responsibility, collaboration, effective communication. Um, now, men tend to score higher than women in areas of assertiveness, stress tolerance, self-regard, confidence, those areas. And I just want to note here that not all men and women fall into this gender specific EQ pattern referenced here, but the research does show that. And so research explored this emotional intelligence uh, that there, there's a gap uh, in, in, in leadership between these genders. And the differences often are advantage, uh, they're an advantage for men and a disadvantage for women. And why would that be? Well, historically, let's think about the leadership qualities that we thought of, we think of a strong leader, right? It's, it's associated with um, uh, assertiveness, with dominance, with confidence, the go-getter, right? The strong, confident uh, leader. So I think first what we have to do is we really have to, to broaden this definition and the understanding we have of what makes great leaders. Our definition and our mindset need to include areas uh, where, where women score higher, for example, right? Leaders can have confidence, but they can also be empathetic with those they work with, right? It's a yes and. Uh, that will build trust, right? Help develop those relationships. And finally, I think in addition to possessing these, you know, solid business leadership competencies, you know, of drive results or strategic perspective, initiative taking, problem solving, those sorts of things. I think it's advantageous that women learn how to leverage their strong EQ skill sets and that men learn how to develop their emotional intelligence skill sets. So both of those uh, working together will, will be helpful. So this is all good. We know what EQ is. We, we know why it's important for leaders and, and the positive effects that it can have for us personally, for us professionally, and, and for organizations. But what do we do to actually um, develop our EQ? Well, the first thing that comes to mind is um, journaling. And um, I think that journaling, and you can journal analog, and you can use it with an app or you can do it electronically. Uh, I must say the research around using paper and pens or pencils, um, that it helps you remember more. It helps you with creativity. It helps you with problem solving. So there's a lot to be said for the pen and paper and, and the journaling. Uh, but that being said, I want to let you know about an app that's called um, How We Feel. And that's the, uh, the icon for it there over on the right, the heart, the colored heart. Um, it incorporates principles from a book called Permission to Feel. And it has a mood meter where you can actually go in and select how you're feeling. And there's so many um, different uh, descriptors in there, but how you feel, and what, what's going on for you. Um, and there's dozens of, I think, research-based uh, strategies to support healthy emotions and, and you know, the regulation of and, and um, your personal tracking of your emotions and capabilities and sharing those. So it's, it's a great app. Uh, but if you decide to use that, great. And maybe you do a combination of both. But you say, okay, I'm going to journal. I'm going to embrace this paper and pencil and get my journal out and start writing. Well, what do I write? What do you do? Well, let me give you a little foundation for that. And here's a technique, if I can get my slide to move, there we go. Um, here is a journaling tool for you. Uh, and you can consider uh, a challenge that you've been faced with. And I just put the last three months here, but um, if you're gonna journal, um, consider a challenge that you've recently had. And the first thing you're gonna do is you're gonna describe the event. Uh, John walked into the office. He told me that I didn't do the presentation correctly. Uh, he left and I did whatever, right? You're just going to describe, it's just a description of the event, just the facts, ma'am, if you will, just the facts. And then you're going to um, think about the emotions that you experienced as a result of this. What emotions came up for you? Um, and then how did you feel about the event, right? I wanted to quit, 
I want to quit immediately. Yeah. Um, I want to throw something at John, whatever the case may be. You're, you're, you're getting it all out and onto the paper. Um, and what were you thinking when it occurred? Did you think, yeah, I knew that wasn't my best work or I've tried really hard on that and spent hours. You know, what were you thinking about when, when that came up? And then finally, what was your response? Did you storm back into his office and tell him to do his own presentations? Did you refuse to, to, to do any more presentations in front of the group? You know, what was the result of that? And what this will do as you start to track it, and this is just one framework. I mean, you could, you could do whatever you like in there, but the idea is that you're, you're looking at what happened, you're looking at your emotions, your feelings, even your thinking, you're trying to connect all that together. And then what was your response? So if we go back to that pathway in the Colorado mountains um, and you're trying to build new pathways, it's imperative that you know your response to different emotions that come up for you. Uh, so that's the idea is that you start to track it. As you start to track this and write about uh, various events, you may see patterns that occur. Uh, and then you can decide that's not how I want to behave, right? That's not what I want to do when I experience that emotion. Um, and so there's there's different techniques that you can use. Um, the one I talked about early on when I was learning to cook was to breathe, to slow down and breathe, talk, think about the emotion that you're having and what you're feeling, right? Process that, in other words, because when we're emotionally hijacked, right, we're not using, we can't use our cognitive abilities, right? We can't use that prefrontal cortex. So you've got to be able to, to calm down and relax uh, and then think um, through what your options are. Uh, and journaling is one of the techniques that will help you that help you do this. You can also use an app you're able to put, uh, and there's various apps, but usually all of them have a way for you to put in what was happening, uh, what you were thinking, what you're feeling. So you can keep track of that and have a pattern over time uh, and see how those work for you. Here is another um, technique that you can do to learn about your uh, emotional intelligence and to learn more about what's happening. And that's to get very granular with your emotion vocabulary, right? Instead of saying, I'm angry or that upset me, is to get really, really granular on it. If you ask research or any experts about emotions, like how many there are, you'll get different numbers, 7, 27, 270, 2,000. And the number is not really what's important here, right? It's that you begin to, to differentiate your specific emotions, right? Granularity. And you move beyond those common, you know, emojis that we have on our phone that we use all the time. Um, so like, for example, right now, if you had a, a situation where you were startled, right? You might say, you scared me. But if you look at this chart, and this comes from the Gottman Institute, you can see that there are many, many ways that you could label that emotion. And so as you begin to look at that and label it, it helps you really get in tune with, with what you're experiencing and what you feel, what you feel in your gut, what you feel in your body. Uh, and, and you're looking to be really accurate, right, with your feelings um, and, and detail that. And then finally, another way uh, that you can um, really develop your emotional intelligence is that is to invest in emotional intelligence training. And I think leaders, um, I've worked with some organizations who, um, who uh, allow the whole organization to be trained in emotional intelligence, right? That builds that culture in there. Uh, <clears throat> pardon me. Um, but investing in it personally or investing in it as an organization. The more that leaders do this, they, they help with psychological safety. It helps build relationships. It helps, helps with outcomes that help the organization and the people individually. Um, so those were a few ways, a little bit about emotional intelligence and how it uh, works with leadership and how you can be a more effective leader. I hope that you have learned something and take something away with you today. And I thank you for your time. Robin, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you so much. Yeah, if you'll advance the slide. Um, so social and emotional intelligence is a really core leadership intelligence. And here at Workplace Peace Institute, we offer a variety of ways that people can um, access learning around both social and emotional intelligence. One is an online course that is taught by Dr. Rossi, and it's a six hour course. It's online, it's self-paced. And what's really great about this course is that you can, you can access this course individually. So it's a course that you can take as a single person 
or you can enroll your entire team or organizations could enroll their entire um, staff in the course. But this course is interactive. It is designed to have some customized elements to it. And um, I really want to encourage you all to take a look at this for your own personal development, or if you are able to um, offer this to your team. We also have, if you'll go to the next slide, another leadership intelligence course called Dignity Intelligence. And Dignity Intelligence really builds on the foundation of social and emotional intelligence and looks at really core competencies and practices that we as individuals can begin to cultivate to support us in really leaning into our ability to honor the inherent worth and value of every individual on our team and in our workplace, as well as practices for honoring our own inherent worth and value and how we do have this tendency to sometimes violate our own dignity. So how we can build on our social and emotional intelligence and really go even deeper into leveraging those learnings to support us in bringing out the best in um, ourselves and each other. And if you'll go to the next slide, um, I just wanted to share some additional courses that we have here at the Leadership Academy. I talked to you just now about the Leadership Intelligence course. We also have a Mindful Leadership course. This is another course that builds on this foundation of a social and emotional intelligence and supports individuals in deepening their capacity for compassionate leadership and for being really fully present to all of the um, needs of the individuals that we're working with and being able to be really present to one another in the midst of um, adversity and times of difficulty, which leads me to, I think, one of um, the most critical leadership skills that we are really faced with in um, our current work environment, which is trauma-informed leadership. There's so much adversity that's happening in the world around us, political violence, social violence, um, violence that we see on um, social media, and then just the the traumas that we own that we experience in our own lives. And I think it's becoming increasingly critical that leaders are able to recognize the signs of trauma and to respond to um, our colleagues and one another and employees through a trauma-informed lens. Another core leadership competency is our capacity to engage directly in conflict. We in Western society have been conditioned to always bring our problems to someone who holds more institutional power than we have, sort of always passing our, um, our sense of power to someone else to intervene and to solve our problems for us. And I think that in this uh, age that we're living in, we really need to be able to cultivate conflict resolution skills that empower us to engage directly an individual in our own personal conflicts in the workplace and in our personal lives. And we, of course, need to grow our competencies in engaging in um, diverse work environments where we are able to really operate with a lens of inclusion so that we can cultivate equity and belonging. So we have several courses that um, that support us in that capacity. So if you will go ahead and um, close out the screen sharing, I'll open this up for conversation and for questions. I actually usually end the recording here, but I have a couple of questions for Dr. Rossi. And um, and I thought we'd keep this, this conversation recorded so that you can come back to this if you, um, if you want to kind of reflect on some of the questions that are asked. So I have three questions that I'm going to I'm going to actually kick off the Q&A with. Um, okay. So one is you talked about in the presentation that emotions are the driving force behind our actions. We have most of us been conditioned to um, leave our emotions at the door, to not th take things personal, um, to, to not bring our emotions into the workplace. Um, but of course, that's not actually possible. <laughs> so I was wondering if you could provide some insights into 
how we like through this lens of emotional intelligence, how do we positively leverage our emotions for cognition and problem solving? And how do we discern when we need to regulate our emotions for cognition and problem solving? Like sometimes I think our emotions can support that. And sometimes I think we need to regulate. And I was wondering if you had any thoughts about the discernment between the two. Yeah, it makes me think of people when they say, oh, it's just overly emotional. Just always emotional, right? You, you think of that, right? Uh, and we, we, when I'm talking about being emotionally intelligent and being able to express and own and understand your emotions, I'm not talking about we walk around crying all the time, right? Or we're just this heightened exci excitement or we're, you know, craziness. Um, it's learning how to recognize the emotion in yourself, recognize how you express it, and does it help you or hurt you in the behavior that follows? right? Because when you're in heightened emotion, you cannot think cognitively. I can't even say it cognitively. You can't think cognitively, right? The emotion is taking over. So when you learn about emotional intelligence and you learn to become self-aware and self-manage, you can work through that emotion so that you can think cognitively. So I think that was the answer to your first question. Uh, what was the second part, Robin? Can you just again, briefly remind me? Um, how to leverage our, um, so I believe that there, when we're having positive emotions, uh, well, let me just pause for a second. There's this saying, you can't be um, mad and curious at the same time. Mm -hmm. And you just talked a little bit about that. And I'm going to come back to that in another question, but I do think you can be joyful and curious at the same time. And so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how we can be intentional about leveraging our, what I think of as like pro-social emotions in, in cognition, like how we are able to make those connections between the two. Yeah. And you can experience several emotions at one time, right? Some of them take over, mm -hmm. but just like you said, being curious and being jo joyful. Um, and I think you have to look at emotions and think of, what, what is it telling me, first of all? What, what is it? What am I learning from this emotion? Why is it happening? Right. Uh, and if it is um, if it is a positive, what I'll call a positive emotion um, that uh, you, you learn how to uh, to utilize that in a way that I would think would affect others around you right? That it's a connection. How do you connect with other people? What emotions help you with connections and what emotions cause you to withdraw or to, um, to recede from, from those relationships? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So uh, Victor Frankl has this famous quote uh, that I'm hoping I get correct because it's off the top of my head, but between stimulus and response, there is a uh, a pause and then that pause is our, is our capacity for choice. That's not the quote, but that's the, the gist of it is that between stimulus and response, we have this capacity to choose, but I think you only have the capacity to choose if you know that there is a space between the stimulus and the response, right? Usually we zoom straight through that space. Mm -hmm. And in that space that he's talking about is really our emotional quotient, our capacity to pause and choose. And so when you were talking about um, making dinner for your husband when y'all were young, and at this time you just sort of intuitively were like, okay, I need to, I need to take a breath here so that I choose differently in my response, that intervention, you know, that, that breath that you took, um, I'm wondering if you could share some just like real tactical personal interventions that people can take. Okay, I'm having a big emotion. I need to activate that pause so that I can choose. What are some things that people can do in that self-regulation space? Yeah, the first one is breathing. You can learn all kinds of breathing techniques that you can do in the grocery store, in traffic, with your spouse, right? That you can breathe and you're not... <laughs> Right. But you're breathing, you're breathing deeply. You're activating the nerves in the belly that cause you to relax. The deeper you breathe, you're, you're, you're activating nerves that are located there that are called the synthetic nerves and they cause your blood pressure to drop. They cause you to relax. So deep breathing will help. 
You could also walk, get up and move away from the situation mm -hmm. before you react. Remove yourself from, from the situation. Walk, take a walk, go around the block, go to somebody's office, go get a cup of coffee, something like that. Change the situation. Those are the two biggest that you can do immediately that usually work in most, most cases so that you can calm down. Mm -hmm. If you have the chance, I would grab that journal or that app and, and note what just happened, what you were thinking, what you're feeling, all of that to get that on paper. And we're not talking about a dissertation here. It's just a few lines, right? To capture what's happening so you know. All of that helps to bring your body back into regulation, right? You've been deregulated by this. So you get back into regulation so that you can use that cognitive ability and think about what it is you wanna do. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Okay. I have one more question and I, I know I'm hogging up the Q&A session. So if anybody else has questions, feel free to raise your emoji hand or to drop a question in the chat. Okay. So my next question is, um, in recent years, there has been a lot of research and conversation and leadership development around the power of vulnerability in the workplace and vulnerability as a leadership competency. 100% agree. But I'm also thinking that there is um, a line where that line that can be crossed, where we are too vulnerable, where we are over emoting. And, um, and I think all of this um, conversation about the critical importance of authenticity and vulnerability in the workplace has gotten a little bit confused with feel free to emote all over the place <laughs> all of the time. And I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about um, kind of where that line is as it, you know, as it relates to emotional intelligence and the impact that over emoting has it from a leadership perspective, when people are looking to leaders to sort of set the vision and to set the tone, how emotions can become confusing sometimes for, um, for people who are uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a reporting structure. Yeah. I think most of us have worked for someone who over emotes, right? We've had a leader, we've had someone that we've worked with that's just overly emotive and it makes most people uncomfortable. But when you first talked about vulnerability, what came to mind was for a leader to say, I don't know about emotional intelligence and I want to learn, that's vulnerability right there. That's the kind of vulnerability we need from leaders who say, I want to learn more. Because if they didn't know something, some business uh, skill, they would say, let me learn this. Let me take a course. Let me figure out what I'm doing wrong or how to get better at it. Uh, and that's the kind of vulnerability I would love to see in our leaders is I want to be vulnerable and say, I don't understand this. I need to know more. I want my organization to know more. I want my people to know more. That type of vulnerability. Um, yeah. And so it can get confusing when we say, you know, emotions, you've got to, you've got to express it. You've got to, you've got to be able to, to, um, uh, understand it and understand other people's emotions. Right. So it does get kind of confusing. Does that mean we go around all the time and, and this we're expressing them so much that it's just, people are walking away from you. Right. That that's uncomfortable for people mm -hmm. as well. Right. So there is a fine line between how do we express that and how do we manage it? Uh, and when is it too much? particularly in the business world. Thank you, Simi. Yes, thank you so much for that. Uh, Malam, do you have a question? Hi, sorry, I was trying to come off mute. I'm, uh, I'm currently in transit to a doctor's appointment, but everything you've shared so far is very insightful. So I just wanted to first say thank you. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I come from a background in sports, which is a very male dominated industry. And mm -hmm. I encountered a lot of different types of leadership styles. I saw the slide you showed on uh, EQ tendencies in females. I may have missed one in males. I, I heard you talk about assertiveness and things of that nature. My question is this, what is the opportunity to enhance emotional intelligence, knowing that that can grow for males in the workplace? In other words, where's the gap in the four quadrants? And what's the biggest opportunity to, to grow emotional intelligence for men in this future of work? 
Thank you for that. And thank you for joining us today. Glad it was helpful. Um, I would say starting with self-awareness uh, for, for those males that that have that score lower in, in emotional intelligence and in some of those pro-social behaviors and uh, uh, and people behaviors that, that we say, because they don't recognize uh, it in them. They don't know when they're angry. I mean, they're angry, but they don't say, oh, what made me angry? I'm wondering. Let me back up here and look at it. They don't have that self-awareness to even understand. And that's where that's honestly where everybody has to begin, right, is with the self-awareness. That's how you learn to manage yourself. If you don't know you're doing it, how do you manage it? How do you change the behavior? Um, and that's really a starting point. Uh, and I think, yes, with particularly in, in sports, right, that's a, we got to win, competition, confidence, right? It's aggressive, uh, right? But but still, if if you're talking about building relationships, right, and, and trust and all of that, that comes into play as well. And I think that any time, male or female, if you develop emotional intelligence and, and that, that EQ keeps to go up, it only makes us more connected to others and, and deeper relationships and more meaningful relationships, which I think as we can all agree, that's not working real well in the world right now, right? So we all need to learn how to do that. Amazing. Thank you so much for sharing. You're welcome. Appreciate it. I have another question, but I'm going to pause and see if others have a question before I jump in again. This one better be a softball this time. <laughs> so we know that empathy is a really important um, emotional intelligence skill. Mm -hmm. And I would love for you to talk a little bit about how people, I think we all have inherently just based off of our own social conditioning and you know, childhood experiences, uh, we all come into the world with a certain level of empathy that we're operating from, and we can grow our capacity for empathy. Um, and so I'd love for you to talk a little bit about how we can be intentional about growing our capacity for empathy. And some of us might have too much empathy. And I'll raise my hand for that one, right? <laughs> that I, I have so much empathy that it can make me physically sick sometimes. And it isn't always appropriate for me to take action, right? That sometimes me taking action is actually me just trying to relieve my own sense of, of too much empathy. Yeah. So I'd love for you to talk a little bit about how we grow our capacity for empathy and when we might need to actually regulate our empathy. Can I start with the last one first? Because I was just thinking about you, mm -hmm. Rob. One, one technique you might use is the journaling. So when you feel like you have to say to someone that you, oh, you know how bad that feels, or, that you could journal about it instead of going out and saying it to them. And after you journal about it, if you're still like, well, I do need to do something. I need to say something. I, I feel like this is important, right? You've had time to process that mm -hmm. emotion. Again, it's no different, right? It's an emotion that you need to process. Um, so after you've written about it, right, or spent some time thinking about it, then you can decide whether you want to act on it. And I think some mm -hmm. people uh, get sympathy and empathy uh, confused, or they sometimes think they're the same, right? Uh, sympathy is just feeling sorry for someone. Oh, I'm sorry you lost your dog, right? And that's, you know, mm -hmm. uh, empathy is when, wow, I lost a dog. And I know that just stinks. That really sucks to be in that position, right? Um, and mm -hmm. so it is putting yourself in the other person's position. Now, you can't always do that. But you can know that it must feel bad, right? Gosh, this just mm -hmm. happened to someone. That's got to feel awful. So you can say something as simple. I know that must feel awful, right? You don't have to be right in the position and know, but you can you can you can assume that that feels really really bad, right? And just say that mm -hmm. to them. So every opportunity you get to kind of put yourself in somebody else's shoes. You can do that watching the news very e I mean, you know, there's so many opportunities that we have on TV, just from talking with people on social media, things happen that if you can put yourself in their position for just a minute and say, wow, I, I, I know how I would feel if I were in this, right? And we're not trying to compare. It's just getting yourself in a mindset of, wow, that's a really bad spot they're in. And you don't have to offer help. Mm -hmm. You're not there to say, how can I help you? Here's what I can do. This is what happened when it was me. You're not trying to solve you're just trying to say, I'm with you. Mm -hmm. I'm with you. That mm -hmm. builds connection, right? That builds that connection of, the, mm -hmm. the, yeah. And thank them for sharing. That's another one is too, is to say, wow, that sounds just horrible. Thank you so much for being vulnerable and sharing that with me or willing to share that with me. So just practicing that simple, simple 
uh, simple little phrases uh, and not thinking you have to do something about it because you, you're not really doing anything. It's just being with the person and being connected. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Okay, we have one really great question in the chat that I think is a great question to okay. close our um, our session out with today. And that is, what is the best way to recommend to a boss that they work on emotional intelligence when they currently <laughs> have a low level of it? That is, we can probably all raise our hands here. <laughs> yeah, that is a great question. There's a couple of ways that you can do that. One is to try to bring some, and, I, and I'm not really just trying to sell emotional intelligence training here. What I'm saying is you can bring some information about, hey, look at this. There's some research around emotional intelligence and how when organizations you know, invest in it with, with their, their uh, employees and their leaders, here's what happens, right? That's one way that you can do it um, with it through, through training, I think would be, and, and through um, research, some of the positives that happen when, uh, when organizations invest in emotional intelligence. Um, that's the first thing that comes to mind. Uh, the other is helping them recognize. You might say something like, wow, you sound like you're really upset about that, whatever that was, right? Um, and to help them recognize. And then they're like, no, I'm not upset. I'm, you know, so maybe they're trying to label it. So you're trying to, in a way, help them label what's going on. If you can, if you can feel that, if you know, right. And you may get it wrong and that's okay. You got it wrong, but just, you know, uh, maybe suggest sometimes to see if that is what's going on and that might help them. Right. And because then you can say, well, what can we do about it? What can I help you with? You know, what would help you in the future? Mm -hmm. um, so kind of helping them label and then bringing, you know, some information about emotional intelligence into the workforce is another one. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much for joining us here today, Dr. Uh, Rossi. Thank you everyone here for coming and spending some time with us this afternoon. I just dropped in the chat the link to our 2024 educational series. Um, I hope you'll check that out. Feel free to go ahead and sign up now for any of those webinars that you see in, uh, that might be of interest to you. We are recording this, so you'll receive this um, recording via email in the next several days. And I just want to thank you all for being here. I hope you have a great afternoon. Bye, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you.